so I was thinking about uh, just just continuing that thought for just a few minutes and and um, you know stay stay engaged I see that we got several people watching us please just for the next few minutes just give me your attention and let me share these thoughts with you and then I'll get out of your way and let you go enjoy the rest of the day but it's important to me that I share this with you it's important to me that I, that I teach this to you and preach this to you listen I'm sitting here I just tested positive for COVID-19 last night I'm, yes. I'm running a fever um, I'm congested and and if, if this wasn't important to me, I would just say, forget it. Do a rerun of one of my sermons. I'm, I'm going to rest today. But I'm not, I'm not looking for empathy. I'm not looking for, man, you're awesome, Pastor. I'm not looking for any accolades. This is just this important to me. This means this much to me that, you know, I, I'll, I'm, I'll take time out of my, I, I will inconvenience myself in order for me to come and teach you some of this stuff that I just really, really want you to hear and need to hear. And I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's just pride, maybe it's arrogance, maybe it's ego. I don't call it what you want to. For me, it's just I'm passionate about it. I love my church. I love my family. I love you guys. And, and I am, I've watched over the years as uh, the church would, would, would start to do really well and only to watch our adversary creep in. And, and bring divisiveness and bring division and, 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 and wound people and, and hurt people and, and cause uh, uh, relationships to be broken and torn. And, and, and I've watched it for years. I've been doing this for nearly 20 years or 19 years at least. And, and it'll be 20 years next year full time. But I've been at this church at Riverside. I've been with you guys for 17 years and, and for 17 years, I've seen the patterns. I've, I've seen it. I've watched it. And, and, and it's like, I, I just, I don't want to just idly sit by and hope that it goes away and hope that it doesn't impact us and hope that it doesn't have an effect on us. Um, uh, I just want to deal with it. I want to do a preemptive strike. I want to, I want to uh, uh, have the uh, sound the clarion call and, and flip on the lights and throw off the blankets and say, hey, guys, pay attention. Pay attention because as Paul said, we have an adversary and we need to be we need to be sober-minded. We need to be vigilant. Not not frightened, not paranoid, not scared, not, not looking for devils in every corner behind every door. I'm not saying that. But, but at least be vigilant. At least be sober-minded. At least be aware that there is this unseen realm. And there are these things called demons. And there are this, there is this adversary who wants nothing more than to trip us up, than to divide us. And you, we've been watching this, guys, for, for, for months and months and months. Uh, gone all the way back to to last year uh, through the pandemic and and into the election and and, and even the beginning of this year we, we we're watching this and 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 I just want I know it's out there and I know it's happening but it doesn't have to impact us it doesn't have to it doesn't have to destroy us it doesn't have to cripple us it doesn't have to have a a, a negative negative uh, uh, consequences for us so so long as we're sober-minded and vigilant and, and, and aware of the schemes and the tactics of our adversary. So I know there's, there's several people watching. I know there's families gathered around watching. I know the number in the corner doesn't necessarily represent everyone because there's families watching. Do me a favor, share this, invite people. Can, you, can they do that? Can yes, they invite they can. people? Invite people to jump in and see this. Invite it's people to, 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 yeah, start a watch party. Is that what it's called? Yes. Start a watch party. Get people in here watching it. And, uh, and uh, to, to listen because I want, oh, here's what I'm going to say. Here's the title. Uh, here's the title of the message for today. I thought it was, I liked it. I thought it was really clever and I thought it was really neat. The title of the message today is this. And again, I'm looking at the life of Jesus. Uh, we, we, we looked at Jesus and his vertical relationships. And I'm going to look at Jesus and his horizontal relationships. And I wasn't sure last Sunday which way I was going to go with this, but as I prayed about it and thought about it, this is the way that we're going. And, uh, and, and that's this. Um, I entitled today's message, Look Like Jesus When You're Hanging Out with Judas. Look like Jesus or be like Jesus when you're hanging out with Judas. And, um, and so uh, the, 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 the idea behind that is, is that uh, let's learn. Let's learn to stay united uh, when there's an enemy that wants nothing more than to divide. Um, not, not just churches, but uh, marriages and families, and, and he, he's wanting to bring division. And, and, so, um, uh, and so how can we, how can we, and so I'm going to look at, 
I'm going to look at the life of Jesus and how Jesus interacted and hung out and ran for three and a half years, did life with Judas that he said, I chose you 12 men and one of you was a devil. <laughs> so it wasn't like he didn't know who he was. He knew who he was when he picked him. And uh, but we're going to talk about how that happened and why, may, why maybe that happened the way that it did and, and how in the world, how, how in the world uh, could Jesus maintain the unity of these 12 men, knowing that within the midst of them was going to be his betrayer and one that he called a devil. Um, and so we're going to jump into that. I just want to share a couple, three points. I got three points and that's it. And I'll cut y'all loose. Uh, but first let me, let me remind you, Psalm 133. I want to remind you of Psalm 133. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, who was the priest of that time. This is Moses' brother. Running down on the edge of his garments, the Bible says, it's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing forevermore. This is the Psalm of David de describing to us just the beauty, the majesty, the power that, that comes with unity. How precious it is when, when, when there's unity amongst brethren and 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 and. The, the, the benefits that come with that. It's precious oil, uh, the psalm teaches us. Jesus in John 15 and even in John 17, he says, I'm praying not only for these disciples, the, the 12 that he had in front of him, but I'm also praying for those who will believe in me through their message. He said in John chapter 17, I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you. You love me. I mean, this is Jesus, man. This is in the Bible. It's in the red letter, so I know it's him. And, and, and this is what he's praying. This is probably one of his final prayers before uh, his arrest and his crucifixion. Um, and, and the thing that I noticed that he's praying for, he wasn't praying for bigger churches or better church services. He wasn't praying that we all really break down and, learn how to pray together and read the Bibles together and not that those things aren't important that's not that but I just I'm just I'm just an observation if you will uh, he's praying for unity and I'm thinking if, 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 if this is this important that that John 15 and John 17 seem to be centered around this idea of unity then then I, I I'm guessing that this must have been important to Jesus and if it was important to Jesus, it should be important to us. If it was critical for him to pray this for us 2,000 years before us even being here, then I've got to, I've got to, I've got to believe that it's critical. It's hypercritical for us. And, and you can tell, and you can definitely see now, pardon me, that in the climate that we're living in, how critical unity is. And so... We're going to talk about that. I'm going to share some of those thoughts with you. Um, I don't. I think I recapped enough. I don't have to recap a whole lot from last week. We did that. Um, here's what I'll say: This, in thinking about this, here's what I know. God is God is a very relation. He's highly relational. If we were at church, I'd say touch a neighbor and tell him God's highly relational. And uh, not only is God highly relational, and we see evidence of that in in the garden. When he created mankind, this was his crown jewel. And the whole purpose of him creating his crown jewel, mankind, was to be in a relationship with them so that they can co-reign and uh, uh, rule and reign on the earth together uh, in a relationship. And, and we saw how the enemy uh, uh, messed that up. Um, and later you see that he, he, he starts over again with a man named Abraham. And uh, he was Abram, and then he became Abraham. Uh, in, in Genesis chapter 11, God, you know, 
called this man Abraham, and uh, he called him a friend. Abraham uh, was a friend of God, the Bible says. And, and, and he says to his friend, uh, I'm going to bless you and your family so that all the families of the earth may be blessed. Um, so, so here it is. This teaches me that God is highly relational and God is also highly missional. And, and because God is relational, he's missional. And because God is missional, he's relational. The two go hand in hand. As Mike would say, it's the same, it's the, it's the same coin with two different sides. Or it's, the, it's, it's a different sides of the same coin. Uh, relational and missional, missional and relational. And, and so we see that, that this is how God is. Now, if you fast forward into the New Testament and, and you see the incarnation of God in the Son, Jesus Christ, and now you see Jesus forming relationships with 12 men, and the 12 men are on a mission. Uh, they have a mission. And because they're on a mission, this tells me that, again, it shows me how God is. He is relational and he is missional. And because he is missional, he is relational. If you were in the deeper discussion with us on Friday night, you would have learned that um, in order for us to effectively disciple people, uh, uh, we must have effective community. In other words, we must learn how to live together. We must learn how to do life together. The only way to really disciple people is not send you to seminary, not send you to Bible school, not, not to send you to a 12-week class to learn how to be a disciple. It's just to roll up your sleeves, engage with one another, build relationships with, with, with one another, and do community and do life together. And in that, you will begin the whole discipleship process. And it doesn't happen in a few weeks. It doesn't happen in a few months. And it won't happen in a few years. It is a lifetime. Discipleship is a lifetime. And so, and so here we have Jesus spending three and a half years with his disciples, building relationships with them, teaching them to have relationships with one another uh, for the sake of the mission. While he was doing that, he chose 12, but one in particular, he chose Judas. And we're going to look at that relationship, and we're going to look at that life uh, of those and, 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 and try, to, try to learn maybe some principles about how we can navigate through this world and maintain unity, resist division, uh, by looking at how Jesus managed his life with a betrayer. I think we've all been there, haven't we? We've all, at one time or another, you felt betrayed. Maybe it was a spouse, maybe it was a child, a close friend, a loved one. Maybe it was a co-worker, someone you trusted, someone you put a whole lot of hope and a lot of faith in. And somewhere along the line, they betrayed you. And uh, no doubt, no doubt, we've been there. In fact, as I'm talking about it, there's probably some images of people flashing before your mind of, of how you felt betrayed. And uh, uh, I taught you a few weeks ago that um, uh, uh, about David and his betrayal with his son Absalom. I've been a pastor for 19 years, so I I know what it feels like to have people come into your life and tell you that they really love you and they really appreciate you, only to watch them walk out the door and never see them again. And it's painful and it hurts. And I didn't come to this revelation until just maybe a year or two, a year or two ago where, you know, I never considered it. I never thought about why God put a Judas in the life of Jesus. Uh, but I'm becoming increasingly convinced that the reason God put a Judas in the life of Jesus was to teach me and you how to go through life and how to get through feeling wounded and betrayed by people that you trust. Uh, so God put a Judas in the life of Jesus to teach you and I how to walk through betrayal. How to, how to live with people that are toxic. How to exist with people that uh, how to maintain unity in a, in a, in a climate where, where, where division uh, seems to be the order of the day. And, uh, and, and I think that's why maybe God put a Judas in the life of Jesus. Because I want to tell you, uh, and I don't know if you're like me, but you know when you have someone betray you, uh, you know I'm thinking again of David and Absalom. David had a son named Absalom who wanted his throne. David being the warrior king who uh, without doubt could have laid waste to Absalom. I mean, David was a fighter. That's all he ever did. And uh, he could have laid waste to him, but instead he chose to walk away. And uh, he, he made some concessions in order to maintain and preserve unity and relationship with his son. He, he made concessions and walked away in order to preserve the longevity uh, of a city, 
uh, he, he, he learned to, to, to walk away uh, in order to protect uh, other people, to protect unity, to protect relationships. And so, and so uh, consider the life of Jesus, how he managed life and went through life with a Judas there. And so, and so uh, there's, there's three strategies I'll give you real quickly. And if you're taking notes, you can write these down. Uh, but three observable strategies of Jesus to prevent division amongst the twelve while living with the Judas. Number one, this is, poor, this is, this is a big one. And maybe I'll get through all three. Maybe I'll just get through this one and that'll be it. Here's number one. Division comes when we lose sight of the mission. Division comes when we lose sight of the mission. At an early age, 12 years old to be exact, Jesus was misplaced by his parents, uh, uh, Joseph and Mary, and uh, they couldn't find him. He got lost, and Jesus was lost. And uh, But they ended up finding him, and when they found him, he was in a temple, and he was in a temple having a conversation with the rabbis there. And when they married, got a hold of him and said, you know, uh, uh, what are you doing? Um, uh, uh, you know, you, you had us worried. You had us upset. And Jesus responded at 12 years old, why would, why, would me, why, why would you not think to look for me here in the temple, in my father's house? Uh, and, he, and he makes this statement, I must be about my father's business. Uh, immediately, at 12 years old, Jesus recognized and identified, I am a person. I, am a, I might be a, a young boy. I might be a young man, but I'm a young man with a mission. And he establishes that at 12 years old. I must be about my father's business. He, 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 he set a precedence. I'm on a mission. He made the announcement at 12. I'm on a mission. You don't hear from him again until he's 30. At 30, he comes, and the first thing he starts talking about, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He's, again, making this declaration, this announcement of a mission. I'm on a mission. Uh, uh, he, he, he comes and he says things like, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Again, he's, he's putting emphasis. He's, putting, he's stressing the idea of the mission. The mission is, I must be about my father's business. Seek first the kingdom of God. Repent the kingdom of God is at hand. When you pray, pray like this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Again, everything Jesus did, read the red letters in the Bible. You'll see that a lot, everything he talked about was the kingdom. He would take little mundane objects and, and, and talk about the kingdom. This was the mission he was on. He had, he had a mission, and the mission was the kingdom, and he would not deviate from that. Division will happen in the church when we lose sight of the big picture, when we lose sight of the mission that we're on, when, when, when we get easily distracted and start looking at little things from our own little corner of the world, and just see it from our own little perspective when we refuse to take a step back and look at it through the eyes of Jesus and look at look at look at life through the lens of 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 of, of, a, of, a, of a follower of Christ when when we refuse to do that and let me tell you how the enemy do it. the enemy will trick you and get you to look at me 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 and and when you start to do that when 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 you fall into that you'll lose sight of the mission that you're on. And it'll, all, and it'll start becoming about you. It'll start becoming about you. And I've watched this. Honey, you and I have watched this over 19 years of ministry. I have watched people that love God, love Jesus. I've watched, I've watched the adversary come in and divide them so easily. These are people that would cry in the altar on one another. Weep with one another, pray for one another, fast for one another. They, I'd watch them be generous one to another. But when they took their eyes off the mission and they put it on insignificant things, when they, when they stopped being about the Father's business, when they started looking at, when, they're, when, when the language went from talking about we to talking about me, oh, that's, good. that's when it changed. That, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's something, you can, that's something you, can, you can use as a, as a reference point, as a litmus test. When you're listening to people talk, if, when you're in your relationships, if, or your marriage, if your marriage is about me, 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 and all you hear is me, and it's never about we anymore, you might be in trouble. 
Because the enemy will get you to focus on the me. The kingdom people don't focus on me. The kingdom people focus on we. And when the language starts becoming, and I've watched this happen. I mean, I can't, I, I've watched, I, I, I've watched over the years, us, I've watched church people quarrel and fight about the most ridiculous things. We'd argue over worship styles. We'd argue over uh, the sound, guitars, over keyboards. We'd argue about versions of the Bible. King James only. New Living Translation, NIV, but not NIV before 1984 and NIV after 1988 or whenever it was. I don't know. They were fight, we were fighting about that. Uh, people arguing about, we never gather enough. We never pray enough. We gather too much. We pray too much. I never have time for my family. I never have time for myself. You don't preach enough. We need more preaching. You preach way too long. We don't need enough preaching. I mean, we argue about the most ridiculous things. Ah, we need revival. We don't need revival. We need more of Jesus. We don't need more of Jesus. We need more revival. We need more. And we would go through this. We would argue over, we need teaching and not preaching. We need preaching and not teaching. I remember, uh, I remember the youth ministry would get upset at the children's ministry. got more attention on a Sunday morning than they did. Or the children's department would get frustrated with the youth department because more money was allocated towards pizza parties than it was towards curriculum. We, we'd fight over the most ridiculous things because we stopped thinking and we stopped looking at the kingdom of God and we started looking at the kingdom of myself. And we started building little kingdoms within the big kingdom. And there can never be, listen, there can't be little kingdoms in the big kingdom. There's only one kingdom because there's only one king. And his name is Jesus. And, and, and so division happens when you lose sight of the mission. Jesus teaches us this right here. He teaches us this in, by, 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 by the way he approached this Judas, by, by the way he dealt with him. Now, he, 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 uh, uh, he didn't allow. He didn't allow... When he chose his 12, he knew he was choosing the devil. Now, why would he do that? I mean, what in the world, Jesus? You know the end from the beginning. Why would you choose one that you said, this is Jesus saying, I chose these 12 and one of you was a devil. You know why he did that, hon? Because he knew that the plan was the cross. Think about that. He knew the mission involved the cross. He knew in order to redeem a broken relationship between God and man, it involved Calvary. And he knew that he would have to go to Calvary. And the only way he was ever going to get to Calvary is someone was going to have to betray him. Someone was going to have to push him towards that. And that someone was Judas. And he could have skipped over Judas, but he didn't. He had to pick Judas. Because Judas was going to be the one that, that pushed him towards the cross. G Judas was going to be the one that betrayed him so that he would end up on the cross. And so here you have Jesus, knowing the end from the beginning, knowing that this was going to happen, chooses this one. Why? Because the bigger picture was on his mind. Because the kingdom of God was on his mind. Because the, the mission was on his mind. And the mission wasn't about his comfort. And the mission wasn't about his convenience. And the mission wasn't about him. The mission was always about you and about me. There's a much bigger picture. There's something always greater on his mind. And he didn't get tripped up over the little details of... You don't think, Ju you don't think Jesus knew that Judas was a thief? John knew he was a thief. John mentions it in, his, in, in, in the book of John, chapter 12, I think it is. He mentioned he was a thief. You don't think Jesus didn't know that Judas was a thief? And yet, there's no verse in the Bible, there's no reference where Jesus rebuked him or corrected him for being a thief. I thought that was why. <laughs> why? There's a bigger picture. There's more at stake. There's more at stake. And, and so, and so, Jesus was made concessions along the way. He made concessions for the sake of the kingdom, just like David made concession with Absalom for the sake of the kingdom. Here's what I wrote. You can write this down. Take heed when all you see is me and not we. Take heed 
when all you hear is me and not we. You're in trouble, friend. The church is in trouble when the language that we're using is me, 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 and not we, we, we. It, it should always be a we. It should always be an us. And it should never just be me and I. And if the, if the common language amongst the believers is about me and I, we're in trouble. Because we're not thinking about the kingdom of God. We're thinking about the kingdom of me or the kingdom of I or the kingdom of... We're not thinking about the kingdom of God. And so you better be aware of that. In any organization or relationship, when the we becomes a me, it's destined to become unhealthy and ultimately fail. I've watched it happen in marriages. I've watched it happen at church. I've watched it happen in business. When you stop talking about we and you start talking about me, you're going to get unhealthy real fast. And, 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 that, and, and that organization, that relationship, that marriage is doomed. And if you can pause long enough and take a step back and see the bigger picture. One of the things that I've tried to emphasize for years with staff and leaders is you've got to stop looking at everything from your little perspective in your little corner of the world. Right. You have got to stretch your horizons. You've got to stretch your thinking. You've got to stop making it about you. If I was in church, I'd tell you, slap your neighbor and tell them it's not about you. Do you know how many concessions I've made along the way? Because it's not about me. How many concessions we've made along the way? Because it's not about me. It's about the kingdom. It's not about my success. It's not about my ego. It's not about my pride. It's not about, it has nothing to do with me. It's always been about the kingdom of God. Always, 100%. And it's got to always be we, 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 me, me, or uh, an us, us, us. It can never just be just, just you looking at you. And so you see that with this. Division comes when you lose sight of the mission, when you lose sight of the bigger picture. That's number one. Number two, and I'm moving here. Division comes when we stop loving one another. Division creeps into the church when we stop loving each other. Even though he would ultimately sell Jesus out and betray him, did you, this is why Jesus still loved Judas. How do I know this? Watch this. John chapter 12, I referenced this just a minute ago. One of Jesus' disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used it to help himself. He used it to help himself to, to what was put into it. So here we have John identifies and recognizes that Judas is a thief. I understand this was written years later, but but uh, John remembers this, and, and, and John knew that he was a thief, and, and if John knew that he was a thief, obviously Jesus, who knows the end from the beginning, and, and announced, I chose you 12, and one of you was a devil, he knew who he was. He knew he was a thief. He knew exactly who he was. And, and the thing that blows my mind that I never considered is... And this really does. I, 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 was, I was thinking about this today. Here, Jesus knew that Judas was a thief, but not one time corrected that. Not one time did he did he point his finger and say, "Hey, you better knock that off. You better you better quit that." He never addressed this his this man's thievery. Why? I think I think he did. I think there's a twofold reason. I think there's a twofold reason why why Jesus never addressed. Jesus, Judas's thievery. I think number one, going back to what I said a minute ago, there was a bigger picture at stake. There was a bigger picture. I, I'm, Jesus wasn't going to abort the mission or detract from the mission of redeeming mankind. Let me say it like this. Jesus wasn't going to detract from the mission of covering everyone's sin to stop and point out and get one man to stop sinning. That would be like taking a surgeon and saying, hey, do my nails for me. It doesn't make sense. Uh, he, he can do a whole lot more, but you just want him to trim your nails? Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? I think Jesus had the bigger picture in mind, and it's like, I don't, I'm not going to stop and, 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 and deal with one man sinning when my mission is to cover all of man's sins and cover them all. 
And I don't know about you, but I am grateful and I am thankful that he didn't stop the mission to deal with one man and try to get one man to stop sinning because he wanted to cover all of my sins too. Thousands of years later, knowing when I was going to be born and I was going to be a sinner, I'm glad he did that. But we don't do that in the church, friend. You know why? Because I, I think, we again, we don't look at the bigger picture and, and we let when, when one person messes up, when one person trips up, man, we jump up on our pedestals and high towers and point down at them and go, oh, look at their sin. And you can learn something from Jesus here. Jesus had a man who was a thief in his, in his 12 and he wouldn't even point it out. He didn't even deal with it. He didn't correct it and he didn't address it but but we we take it upon ourselves to to make sure that we pluck out everybody's little splinter when we got planks in our own eyes oh i'm preaching in here (laughs) are you hearing me and and so it's wild to me and i think it's just in the scope of 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 the things that jesus is dealing with Mm -hmm. judas's thievery was 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 not that big of a deal in the moment he was he was looking at the scope of eternity he's looking at the scope of mankind and it just wasn't, that was not a big deal in the moment. I'll deal with this. I'll deal with this issue when I go to the cross. I'll deal with it then. But we, we don't look at it that way. We got to, oh, no, no, no. They offended or they broke a rule and they got to be held accountable to that. Let's deal with it. Look at the bigger picture, friend. I, I've dealt with criticism in, in years past because uh, I would seemingly let people get away with atrocities. Mm-hmm. I would seemingly let people get away with misbehaving. Uh, uh, they smoke, they drink, they cuss. They, how are you going to let that man come up there? He committed adultery on his wife. And, and all this nonsensical stuff that, man, we would just point the finger at and, 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 and want to just lay waste to him. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I don't see it like you do sometimes. And it, it has nothing to do with my call as a pastor. It has, it has everything to do, I believe, with just being a follower of Christ. And that is, I try to see things eternally. And say, yeah, I can point this stuff out. I can lay waste to them. I can blow them out of the water right now. But, but, but what would be the point of that? What if, what if we lose this one? What if we say things and do things that, 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 that causes this one to, 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 to look at the church and look at the body of Christ with disdain and, and hurt and pain? There's a reason people stop coming to our churches. There's a reason our churches aren't flooded anymore. There's a reason they don't, think, they don't take us serious. Because unlike Jesus... We like to point out every little thing they do wrong and everything we do wrong. I think we do it to deflect off of what we're doing and how we're living because we don't want anybody to say that's what people do. I watched this happen a million times. I've watched leaders in the church, none currently, mind you, but I've watched leaders in the church. Who were, who were doing things they shouldn't have been doing, and they would deflect onto other people and make sure every, their sins were highlighted so we wouldn't see the, yours. And can I just say, and I will say this, I've seen every one of theirs too. Never pointed them out, though. You know, we do, we cover them with grace. Why? This is the second reason. The second reason is because that Jesus didn't point out his thievery was because Jesus loved him. Do you know why I don't go around pointing out all your failures and shortcomings? Well, number one, I have plenty of them myself. (laughs) A man who sows in grace shall reap in grace. Because I love you. I genuinely love you. you. How many times do people come into my office and confess things to me? You don't hear about it out of my mouth. Thank God I have short term memory and I forget Mm -hmm. things real easily. No, I do because I love you. And I'm convinced Jesus loved Judas. How do I know that? Watch this. Matthew chapter 26. Here's Matthew chapter 26. Watch this. And even as Jesus said this, this, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. This is Gethsemane. They're coming in to arrest him. Now watch this. They have been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. The traitor Judas had given them pre- a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi. He exclaimed and gave him a kiss on the cheek. Now watch verse 50, what Jesus said. My friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. What? What? Did Jesus say what he said to Abraham? My friend. 
I'm going to tell you right now. There are other words and other names that I wanted to call everyone that ever betrayed me. Friend was never one of them. I would imagine some of them probably started with the letter F. Mm -hmm. Just keep it holy, keep it pure. <laughs> he called him friend. He called him friend because I'm convinced he genuinely, truly loved him. 1 Peter 4, 8 says this, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. Jesus said in John 15, there's greater love. There's no greater love than this when a man shall lay down his life for his brothers. Here Jesus loved this man Judas. This one that he knew was a devil. This one that he knew would betray him. And Jesus refused to let division come in to the, to the twelve. He refused to let his hatred. He refused to let this man's sin. He refused to let his fevery. He refused to let it disrupt the unity that he was building. The relationship. He was preserving relationships. He was wanting to uh, preserve the relationships of the twelve. He was. He was. He was wanting to. He covered. He was. He, he, division comes into the church when we stop covering for each other. Do you know that? You know why we stop covering for one another? Because we don't look out for one another. We just look out for me. Because that's what the world teaches. That's what society teaches. Society teaches, look out for you. Nobody else is going to look out for you. You better look out for you. And that may be true in the world, but that shouldn't be true in the church because we do not conform to the patterns and the behaviors of this world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. And it ought to look different in the church. and ought to feel different in the church. and ought to be different in the church. And if it is not, then find another church. Because we ought to be covering for one another. Love covers a multitude of sin. Doesn't highlight it. Doesn't point it out. Doesn't criticize it. Doesn't swing at the low-hanging fruit. And I know it's easy to do that. But Jesus didn't do it. If there's anything we can learn from Jesus, if you want to keep the unity and resist the division, then you've got to get to the place where you continue to love one another. Even past transgressions and sins and betrayals and hurts. That's what Jesus is teaching us here with Judas. And don't give me the, well, he was the son of God. He was a man who was filled with the spirit. Just like you are people that are filled with the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, quickened your mortal body. Just like Jesus, there are things that he was able to accomplish that we can accomplish because the same Holy Spirit that was in him is the same Holy Spirit that's in me and is in you. And I'm here to tell you, if he was able to do it, he's giving us an example and permission that you and I can do it too. We have got to learn to love past. Learn, learn to love past. And I, I'm, trust me when I tell you, I know I'm preaching to myself and I have not arrived. I stink at it. Because, well, watch this. Watch this. This is what Paul teaches us. Let me, let me say it. Here's what Paul teaches. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. Isn't that interesting? Love doesn't demand its own way. Love doesn't look at the me, the I. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable. Here's the biggie. Here's the biggie. This is where church people mess it up. Love keeps no record of being wronged. Why do we not Live by that verse. You all highlighted that in your Bible with a black permanent marker. <laughs> Love keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Whew. Hold on, uh -huh. I gotta catch my breath. Yeah. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> <clears throat> Are you hearing me in here? I, we're hearing you, baby. <laughs> This is where church people screw it up. It keeps no record of being wrong. Division enters in easily. The enemy brings division in easily. When he starts whispering in your ear, yeah, 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 but do you remember what they said about you? Yeah, yeah, do you remember what they did to you? Oh, 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 I know, I know they're weeping. I know they're crying out. I know they said that, but you better be careful. Remember what they said? Remember what they did? Remember what they did? And then you, you got a checklist. You got a checklist that you keep. 
Or maybe you don't write it down on paper, but you've got a checklist. You keep it right here. And, 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 and you're, you're a record keeper. And some, some of the, so I know church people that are some of the best record keepers on the planet. I, mm. I try not to be. I really do. And there's a lot of things that I don't remember. Like I genuinely don't remember. But there's one or two things about people that I just remember. And I'm like, and I'm not saying I'm right for doing it. I'm 100% wrong because, listen, here's what I wrote down. If you are a record keeper of every time someone did you wrong, then you really don't know what real love is. Furthermore, you'll never taste the fruit of intimacy and unity. In other words, you'll be one miserable, lonely person who's always jealous and envious, longing for the intimacy and the unity that you see in other relationships. And it's only because the reason you don't have it is because you're a record keeper of every time you've been done dirty and been done wrong. And the enemy will use that against you and me 100% of the time. And there are so there is there's so many schisms and divisions because we are record keepers. I don't know. You say, "Well, I'll forgive them when they ask for forgiveness." <laughs> no. Is that how it works? What Bible do you read? That's incorrect thinking, my friend. Jesus loved this Judas. He loved him. He knew he was a thief. He knew he was a betrayer. He never called him out for it. Didn't rebuke him. Didn't correct him. There was a bigger picture and he loved him. And I'm just convinced that there was no division able to creep in there because Jesus refused to, to, to stop loving him. And I'm just saying we can learn from that. I got one last point and I'm done. Y'all doing well? Yeah. One last point and I'm done. Well. Division comes when we stop serving one another. Division comes, number one, when we stop seeing the bigger picture, when, 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 we, when we lose sight of the mission. Division comes when we stop loving each other. And division comes when we stop serving, when we stop giving. That's when division comes. Now, I'm using the, the examples of the relationship between Jesus and Judas. It's uh, They're in the upper room. And uh, if Jamal was here, I'd say, Jamal, come play something soft. <laughs> Jamal, if you're watching, go to your keyboard and play something soft. <laughs> uh, I would, uh, it's the scene is the upper room. Not the upper room with the Holy Spirit, but it's an upper room. It's the final last supper, it's called. Jesus is there with his disciples. And I would say that supper had ended. They, they stopped eating. They stopped satisfying their flesh they stopped satisfying themselves and the supper had ended and jesus does something remarkable he stands up he takes off his outer robe and he takes a towel and he wraps a towel around his waist he grabs a basin of water that was there and he approaches john the beloved and washes his feet goes to Thomas and bows and washes his feet. He goes to Peter and he gets down and begins to wash his feet. Of course, you know Peter. And I'm not going to have you do that, Jesus. Jesus said, if I don't do this, you'll have no part of me. And he said, well, in that case, wash all of me. He's washing all these disciples' feet, Matthew and Mark and Luke. He's washing their feet. And you know who else was there, babe? I never thought of. Judas. This betraying thief was there. This scoundrel, this thieving betrayer. And the two purest, holiest, most righteous hands dipped him into a basin and touched the feet of this thief this betrayer knowing who he was did not stop Jesus from serving him 
division comes in when, when you and I stop serving one another. And, and we say, well, I can't, I, I can't, I'm not going, I'm not doing that for them. They, 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 didn't, they didn't invite me to their party. I'm not going to their party. They, they didn't help me uh, change the oil in my car. I'm not going to help them move. They didn't do thus and such for me. I'm not doing thus and such for them. And we start going through our eternal list of how we were done a certain kind of way. And, and, and let me tell you, when you start doing that, friend, division comes in. And I'll tell you another thing as I'm sitting here thinking about it. God's going to keep putting Judases in your way. He's going to keep putting you, putting the Judases in your way until you finally get down and start serving them and washing their feet like Jesus did. And you can keep resisting and rebelling and saying, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. And five years from now, there'll be another Judas there that you have to wash their feet. And you can refuse, but guess what? Three years from now, there'll be another Judas. And a year from now, and five years from now, ten years from now, until you finally get to the place where you say, well, I'm trying to be like Jesus. And you're praying, God, make me more like you. And God's like, I'm going to make you more like me. I'm going to put a Judas in your life. And you're going to learn to serve the Judases. You're going to learn to serve the ones that betray you, that, that spitefully use you. You're going to learn to serve them. Because it's not about you, it's about a kingdom. And I'm developing something in you. I'm developing character in you. I'm developing something in you that is bigger than you. It's a kingdom thing that I need out of you. And I'm going to keep putting Judases in front of you until you learn to humble yourself in front of those people. My God. If the two purest, holiest, righteous hands can dip them into a water basin and grab on to the filthiest feet of his betrayer and wash them, then who am I not to serve anyone? Who am I? Who am I to refuse? Who am I to, to, to absolutely say, nah, they don't deserve my service. They don't deserve my skills. They don't deserve my, nah. Now, it don't work like that in the kingdom. Works like that in the world, maybe, but it don't work like that in the kingdom, I promise you that. doesn't work like that in the kingdom. Division comes in when we stop doing for each other, when we stop looking out for each other, covering, covering each other's flaws, covering each other's fail, failures, covering each other's sins. When all you want to do is highlight what everybody else did wrong. When all you want to do is highlight those things. And when you refuse to serve somebody because they didn't do you that way or they didn't treat you that way or they weren't right to you and you refuse to serve, all you're doing is creating a foothold for the enemy to come in. And I'm here to tell you, I watched it happen in my church for 19 years. Jesus. You're just inviting your adversary to come in and wreak havoc in your life. When you husbands stop being the husbands that your wives need you to be, I'm not serving them that way. They don't deserve it. They did me wrong. You're inviting your adversary to come in and destroy your marriages. I've watched it happen. I've counseled them as they went to get divorced. Because husbands wouldn't do right and wives wouldn't do right because they didn't think you deserved it. They didn't deserve it. Why should I? Well, I'll tell you what, when your hands become as pure and holy, as righteous as Jesus. I mean, if he could get down on his knees with a towel wrapped around him and cleanse the feet of a Judas. You mean to tell me you can't love your wife because she did you wrong years ago? You mean to tell me you can't love your husband because he did something, he said something about your mama years ago? You mean to tell me you, come on, friend. Uh, I can't, I can't, uh, uh, well, they didn't say hello to me in the hallway at church mm -hmm. six months ago. And so why should I, you know, give them an offering? Why, why should I go and do anything for them? They, they did they didn't, they didn't sing my song when I asked them to. They, they didn't, they didn't text me back. They didn't, my God, you opening up the door for the enemy to come in and wreak havoc in your life and in your church. Ooh. I'm getting lightheaded. Okay. <laughs> My goodness. Division comes in, guys, when, you, when, we, when we refuse to serve each other, refuse to do for each other, refuse to help each other. 
when, when we start draw, dragging up lists of things that people did to wrong this one and say, well, they don't deserve it. Well, Judas didn't deserve to have Jesus' two purest, holiest, righteous hands to wash his feet, but Jesus saw fit to do it anyway. And so who am I to say? Who, who, who am I to judge? Who am I? Yeah, but you don't know the pain they caused me, Pastor. You don't know the hurt they caused me, Pastor. <laughs> Did they kiss you on the cheek or were you arrested, beaten and crucified and hung naked in front of all mankind? <laughs> oh, well, then I say, maybe you didn't have it that bad after all. I apologize. I'm not trying to minimize your pain. I don't want you to be betrayed. I felt pain. But I'm also, I'm also feeling conviction. I feel convicted. Because maybe, maybe I thought I was too good to serve somebody who did me wrong. Maybe I thought I was too good. But, but maybe, maybe I feel convicted because I don't have a long list, but I, have a, I still have a list. There may be only one or two things listed on it, but I still have a list of where I was done wrong. And all that, all I've, all I've watched that do for 19 years is take good people that love Jesus, good people that love Jesus, and get derailed, and get wrecked, and get ruined, because we couldn't get our stuff together long enough to learn a few little principles. This is what it really looks like to be like Jesus. This is what it really looks like. And if Jesus is a man baptized in the Holy Spirit, can exist and keep unity with 12 other men while there was a Judas in the midst, then you and I are fully capable of doing the very same thing because the same spirit that raised him from the dead quickens my mortal body and your mortal body. And there's no more excuses, guys. There's no more excuses. There are no more. There are certain behaviors that I've allowed to exist and that I have tolerated that I just won't let it exist and tolerate it anymore. And I will address, and I will, and I will deal with. I'll, 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 I'll be as gentle as a dove. But, but, I, but I, I don't, I don't see, I don't see why it's unreasonable for me to hold us, Riverside. I'm talking to Riverside. I don't see why it's unreasonable for me to hold us to this standard. I, I don't think that's unreasonable. I don't think it's unreasonable to hold us to this standard. You have the same Holy Spirit that Jesus had. So anyway, there's my three points. Thank you so much for staying engaged. It looks like Day. everybody Day. probably stayed engaged. I don't even know what time it is. It's 1130. It's 1130. Thank you so much. I, even through my tears and my snot yeah. and my congestion, thank you for, for listening. Take, take this. Take, mm -hmm. take this and marinate on this. Go back and watch this over again. Go back and listen to this over again. Brandy, if you're, I know Brandy's going to be watching. I don't know if she's watching now, but I know she will. But she'll take clips she of this will. and she'll put it on TikTok and she puts it all on the, you know, all the social media. Find it on there and 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 use this because we are in a climate, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, where where we are a divisive people in a divisive nation. And I think it's because we, we, we exist and we, we try to worship in churches that are divided. And, and I just want to bring unity. I don't want to argue with, with people that are anti-mask and anti-vaccine. And I don't know if you are, okay. If you're not, okay. I won't beat up on you. Don't beat up on me. I won't criticize you. Don't criticize me. I'll still serve you. Even if you say, I'm an anti-vaxxer and you get sick, I'll still pray for you. If you refuse to wear a mask and, and, and you make someone sick, I'll still pray for them. Uh, I'm not going to get divided over these trivial things. I'm not going to trip over trivial things because there's a bigger picture. There's a greater mission that you and I are on, and it's called the kingdom of God. It's called the kingdom. May his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Why? How are we going to usher in the kingdom? How are we going to... How, is, how are we going to pray, let your kingdom come and will be done if we divide over a mask or a vaccine? 
<laughs> How is that going to happen? Jesus didn't call out Judas's thievery. I'm not calling out anybody's when they disagree with me or I disagree with them. So, anyway. I'm sweaty. I love you. Thank you for watching. Pray for me. I'm, I am dealing with COVID-19, so pray for me. If you didn't already do it, make sure you give. I know we didn't meet in person, but, mm -hmm. but I'm still encouraging you to give online. You can give at rcclife.com. Give at rcclife.com. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Is there a button on there, baby, they can she, push? Uh, they have they put it in the, There's the a chat. There's a link and you in the chat. Yeah, or go directly to the or website. Or save your money, save your check, and bring it next week. We're planning on meeting next week. Yes. Um, we were able to, uh, uh, the, one of the reasons we postponed today was to was to, to mitigate the spread of this thing so that we would only miss one week there and we can come back next week. And um, so that's the reason we did that. Um, it just popped up the giving list. All right, so there's the giving there. You can click on rcclife.com to give. If this message blessed you, if it ministered to you, um, I encourage you to uh, sow, and invest, and give. Uh, if it blessed you in any way, just click on that and, and be sure to give. Um, and that way I can keep, keep doing what I'm doing. I can keep bringing you things like this and teaching you things like this. You guys are awesome, man. I love you all so much. I missed you dearly today. I really do. I, I so value community and being together with you and you know but I didn't want to take any risks or chances today and uh, with the exposure that I've encountered and, and other uh, staff and leaders have as well we love you we appreciate you um, hopefully you'll have a good rest of the day today and um, we are planning on being back in the building next Sunday at 10 30 um, there we're not meeting Friday night. We're not doing deeper discussion this Friday night because it's Labor Day weekend. And, um, and so uh, there's some, some of us are traveling, going on vacation and all that sort of stuff. So anyway, we won't be on deeper discussion um, uh, this weekend. But I tell you what, because I love you and I know you love me and you know that I uh, uh, recently tested positive for COVID-19, Maybe we'll stream later on in the week, me and Tina. I'll yeah. stream from here to give you an update on how I'm doing. If you like that, send up some thumbs up. I see hearts going up. But if you want an update from me later on in person on the live stream, shoot some thumbs up on the little thing over there. How do they do that? They, they, they know. I don't know. There yep, they are. There they are. So <laughs> I, will, I will try to stream later on in the week yeah. to give you uh, updates on how I'm doing uh, so that you can see my pretty little face. I love y'all so much. I appreciate you. Uh, I have my phone. Yeah. Feel free to text me and uh, give me well wishes. I'm good with that. I'm not doing anything. I'm staying You're here at the house. Here. So I'm okay. You're not going to disturb me. Um, uh, if I decide to lay down and take a nap, I'll put my phone, my phone on uh, silence or whatever. But uh, I'm, I'm good to chat. I'm good to talk. I'm good to communicate with you so you're not going to disturb my peace i want to hear from you and i want to be able to i want you to hear from me as well i love y'all so very very much i do miss you uh keep praying for me i'll keep praying